Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, we have a special episode with returning guest, Yohei Nakajima, builder of AI agents and VC investor. As you may recall, when Yohei appeared on the show back in October, he had just recorded a talk at the TED AI event. As of mid-January, that talk is now online for all to see. So Yohei and I sat down on the morning of his birthday to watch the talk in full. Along the way, we paused it to discuss and expand on some of the important themes that he raises regarding identity and how Eastern and Western cultures relate to the rise of large language models. This was a great conversation, and I had a lot of fun doing it. But unfortunately, when we came to upload the video to YouTube, we got a copyright strike, and we have not been able to resolve that. So to see this full episode after the upcoming few minutes of highlights, I really hope you'll go to our website, cognitiverevolution.ai, where you can get the audio only version and also subscribe to our audio channel if you've not done that already, and also see the full video on our Substack page. So thank you to Yohei for suggesting this. It was a lot of fun, a great conversation, and I hope you'll go see the full thing at cognitiverevolution.ai. I think Western identity tends to think of like, my thoughts are who I am. And so my mind and my thoughts are, are my identity. I do feel like Eastern cultures tend to treat the mind and the brain as more of a tool to control and your thoughts as an output of that tool. And so like meditation and enlightenment is really about harnessing how to, how to leverage that tool. As I get emails, as I get texts, as I, you know, as I follow people on Twitter, as I read websites, if I could just convert all that into a structured knowledge graph of the people and entities and events, it should be easier to like identify potential people to reach out to, to connect with, introductions to make amongst people, right? I've seen a couple of early tools of like helping people understand each other that previously wouldn't, or helping find commonalities between two groups of people that might not be intuitive. And I think if we can start to think about AI as, as a tool for that, new ideas will emerge that can hopefully create a future that's not, not as bleak as, as right? Some, some people see the future. Maybe for starters, you know, take us a little bit more kind of behind the scenes of literally how do you do that work procedurally? When I'm thinking about like building a next mod of baby AI or any AI tool for that matter, right? After I built like a first prototype, I will run it over and over again with multiple different prompts and examples. And I'll watch it do things. And I just watch it over and over and over again until something like clicks for me when I'm like, wait. And I mean, a lot of the stuff I would want to retrieve is online, I guess, right? A lot of my work is I'm doing web research all the time. And so I did find that with GPTs or with assistants, you can actually just tell it to like do a web browse with like a site specific search, for example. And it's kind of like you built a retrieval over a website. I have a prototype like autonomous CRM that I've been testing, which uh, I'm testing it with Game of Thrones episode descriptions from Wikipedia. And so I'll like upload one episode description at a time. And the idea is that it's like on the back end building a knowledge graph of all the information. For episode by episode, season by season. And, you know, you would perhaps want a history of like this person is, you know, aligned with this person and then their enemies, you know, and there's kind of a, you know, it's not just one fixed description. I think the concept of identity in today's world, a lot of people think about like, who am I? And they make it really like, you know, internal versus I wanted to get people to start thinking about identity as, you know, your place in a, in a larger system, I guess. It was only after I grew up that I started to really appreciate how much philosophy is embedded into language, especially specifically Japanese language too, because you're using Chinese characters where where the characters themselves have meanings. Uh, a good example is is uh, a common word, a common you know way to greet someone is Genki desu ka? Like, are you Genki? Is how Japanese people would greet someone. But the the characters for Genki are Gen is root and Ki is energy. So it's like, how's your root energy? Is like the most casual way in Japanese to like ask someone how they're doing. And I think that's like that's a very philosophical way to ask somebody how they're doing. For me, and you know, I think for most who have just kind of the traditional Western background. We do, it is natural to think of ourselves primarily as individuals. And, you know, then this thing is like this kind of weird language model. And I've got to, you know, tell it what role to play, tell it what individual to be. What I didn't get into the talk is that a lot of these studies, when they're looking at the interaction of ants, they're also looking at the trails ants leave as part of the collective intelligence of like a communication. So if you look at a single ant, you would not consider the trail they leave as part of that ant. But when you think of the ant colony as an identity, then the trails they leave, the tools they use to communicate with each other become part of that collective intelligence. So if you look at me individually, my computer is not part of my intelligence. But if you look at human society as a collective intelligence, then our computers, the technologies, the internet all become part of that identity of that collective intelligence.